Set deep in the heart of Nova Scotia in a town called Valentine Bluffs, a killer dressed as a miner decides to take out his vengeance on Valentine's Day by killing anyone who dares celebrate the holiday. As tensions rise in the town, the killer's identity remains a mystery, leading to a shocking twist that will leave you on the edge of your seat. With its intense violence and suspenseful atmosphere, My Bloody Valentine is a cult classic that has left a lasting impact on the horror genre. So grab your popcorn, turn off your lights, and get ready to explore the dark and twisted world of My Bloody Valentine here today on Patio Commentary. Hi everyone, my name is Matt Jarbo. Welcome back to Patio Commentary. This is episode number 28, and I think it's a great time to go after Valentine's Day of the year by talking about one of the most, if not the most, seminal horror movie centered around a love-themed holiday. And I think My Bloody Valentine from 1981 is an absolutely great film to dive into. And I'm really happy that I, I chose it for this week, predominantly because I'd never seen it before. It came out a year before I was born, and I knew that the movie existed. I've seen the 2009 remake in 3D, no less, but I never got around to actually watching this classic. And I do call it a classic because the movie is, it's very fun. It's not what I'd call the scariest thing on the planet, but I just, I found it to be very charming for what they were able to do with it and very effective for creating an atmosphere of, you don't quite know who's going to die and how they're going to die. And uh, I got to admit, some of the kills were pretty spectacular considering that the budget was so low. But before we dive into the episode, I just want to remind everybody that if you haven't already, be sure to check us out on Patio Commentary on Twitter. You guys can also find me on Instagram and TikTok under the name Real Matt Jarbo. And if you really want to support the show, the best way to do that is to subscribe over on youtube.com forward slash Patio Commentary. Help us get to a thousand subscribers over there and 4,000 hours watched, you know, for monetization or patreon.com forward slash Matt Jarbo. Great way to support the show as well as, you know, you can join the tier that allows you to pick your own movie. So that's something to consider. And uh, you know what? That's all we're going to show for today. Why don't we talk about My Bloody Valentine's? If you haven't seen the movie, obviously go watch it. Come on back. Podcast will be here. But for those of you who just need a quick little refresh, let me give you the synopsis, a little bit of the rundown. There's a big Valentine party planned in the little coal mining town of Valentine Bluffs, Nova Scotia. It's the first Valentine's Day party in 20 years because there was an accident in the mine. And the accident happened when the men responsible for the security were at a party. The sole surviving miner, a man named Harry Warden, later killed them all and told the town to never arrange a Valentine's Day party again. But when this party begins, so does the killing. That's... A nice way of talking about this movie. It's got a really simple story to it. It really does. You know, it's all about uh, this town who's lived in fear of Valentine's Day killer for 20 years. They've allowed it to stop them from even celebrating the holiday. But they figure 20 years later, it's a good time to raise the communal spirits and just put on a nice party. And of course, this does bring out the killer miner. But before we dive into the plot of the movie, I want to go through how this movie came to be. Because as always, part of the love of movies always comes from talking about how it ultimately found its way from someone's mind to the silver screen or the small screen. And it's great. So in the case of My Bloody Valentine, uh, George Milhaka directed the film. He's most known for directing this movie overall, and it has ultimately gone on to gain a cult following and is ultimately considered a classic in the horror genre. There were other movies that Milhaka directed, such as The Surrogate from 1984 and Blue Monkey in 1987, but really, My Bloody Valentine is considered his most notable work. But according to IMDb, he also apparently directed 14 episodes of the MTV show Undressed back in the early 2000s. If you don't remember this show, I don't blame you, I do, because it was effectively late night softcore porn for college kids at a time when MTV felt like it was being, you know, all edgy and whatnot, and uh, definitely not whatever the hell it is today. 
the show Undressed was more of a soap opera mixed with a lot of college kids just hooking up, but it was an interesting thing to watch back then. And I didn't know that he had anything to do with it, but it kind of makes sense if you think about it. That movie had a lot to do with young adult sexuality and, and horror movies often very much carry the same kind of idea behind them. So who knows if that played into it at all, I I'd have to go back and try to find the episodes that he did. However, I don't know where you could even find this. I highly doubt undressed is on paramount plus, but um, you could probably find clips on YouTube if you're really, really dying to see exactly what um, this specific show was about. But who was the screenwriter? Well, that was a man by the name of John Beard, who was also a film producer. He was responsible for scripting two of the most well-known slashers in the early 80s. That would be My Bloody Valentine and also Happy Birthday to Me, which came out the same year. However, his work on Happy Birthday to Me went uncredited. And he's really just known for My Bloody Valentine because sadly in 1993, he died at the age of 40 in Los Angeles, California, which is always tragic because I feel like his work on that story would have been really cool to see brought back up in other mediums, but sadly that never happened. Now, going back to George Milhaka, the director, when he got the opportunity to direct this movie, he actually has said that it was all by accident. It was mostly because he had directed a small independent team comedy called The Pickup Summer that did good business in Canada and the United States. And based on the strength of that, John Dunning and Andre Link's company, Cinepix, asked him to develop a comedy movie for them. He was working on the script with a few people from National Lampoon, but the screenplay, it wasn't ready yet, and they couldn't get the script ready in time for the liking of John and Andre. At the time, he had a contract with them to develop two films. John and Andre turned around and told him it was impossible to be able to shoot the film in the summer or the fall. And because the comedy couldn't be done at that point in time, John Dunning then asked him if he would be interested in doing a horror movie with Cinepix. And the second film he was contracted to do could be done later. And Milhaka agreed. And this is how George Milhaka actually met writer John Beard because Beard was hired by Dunning to come up from LA and work on the script with him. But they only had five or six weeks to write the script and they had to go through it scene by scene so people could start prepping before they even had a full script out. This kind of feel like it happens in this day and age as well. Oftentimes they have like what the shooting script and then it alters and it changes as the shoot progresses. But I mean, it kind of shows you that movies are oftentimes really under a hard deadline. And so they've got to get it made and they will literally pull the cart before the horse more times than not. Milhaka also said that a major driving force for this was because Paramount and Frank Mancuso were willing to do a pickup and a national distribution of the film as long as they could get it out by Valentine's Day. He said that it was an incredible challenge because they had to be ready to open in 1,200 theaters across North America, and it was one of the largest openings of the time. Now, in another interview, George had talked about how the movie was different from other slasher films of the era. He said that the formula in those days was a couple of cheap bungalows in a sleepy suburbia, usually with characterless suburban teenagers that were all relatively interchangeable. He said that the movie was a combination of both a project that he believed in and a way of getting his foot in the door. He wanted to take the movie out of the suburban bungalow context and set it in a place with a slight hint of social consciousness. He had said that the movie was the first film in the era where teenagers were talking about the fact that there were no futures left, no jobs, and no hope. And he believes that this might still resonate after all of these years. Truth be told, he's not wrong. You know, you watch the movie and it has all the miners and they're talking about the mine and the mine is effectively their life. Their fathers work there, they work there, their children will work there. That's effectively what they're going to do. There's no real getting out. And that ends up being something that they kind of accept and they kind of deal with. And that's why they think they really, really, really want the party. It's because it's just something different or it's just something to get excited for when really there's not much else in their town besides grow up, work the mind, get married, have kids, settle down, die. And that's really about it. 
And I, that does probably resonate pretty well with a lot of kids these days, but there's a lot of Gen Zers that kind of feel the same way, even though we have a much more abundant world and economy than things were in 1981 when this movie came out. You know, I've brought this up multiple times before, but look, from 1979 to 1999, our world population literally doubled from 3 billion to 6 billion people. So if those people at the start of that boom, of that population boom of doubling our world population, if they were feeling that way, imagine how people today might feel when everything kind of feels out of reach. I mean, it, that's the thing with horror movies that I really like is oftentimes whatever element of social commentary they want to make or, or whatever fear they want to play on is largely transferable in between different generations. And it's always kind of relatable in many different ways, which is pretty great. Now, this movie was actually shot in the small town of Sydney Mines, Nova Scotia. The film had a pretty like low budget and the filmmakers were able to make the use of most of it by using real coal mines in the areas as a location. In fact, the film's iconic mining suit was also made from real mining equipment. Now, as for the location of the mine, this actually got chosen by George Mohaka while they were in that five or six week prep period to get the script done. John was back working on the screenplay and George was out doing location scouting. And this is where they came across the Princess Colliery Mine located in Sydney Mines on Cape Breton. Now, the mine itself had been closed since 1975, but everything there was still in working order. They had considered another location that was roughly about 20 or 30 miles away from Sydney, but it was already too touristy. And the one they had picked was in a dreary, cold, and dusty area. But once the townspeople found out that they were going to shoot a Hollywood movie there, they came out and they repainted the whole thing and spent $50,000 in order to spruce it up to make it look nice and appealing for the film crew, when in reality it was chosen because it looked like ass, and then the film crew had to spend another $75,000 to return it back to its original state. You gotta love the town. They had their hearts in the right place, but man, when you're doing a low-budget horror movie that relies on the ambiance of the area, and you go and you make it look like a whore in church, it's, it's not going to work out very well. Now, when asked about the challenges of making My Bloody Valentine, Milhaka had said that shooting the scenes in the mines were the most challenging part. When they were filming in the mine, which, by the way, was about 2,700 feet below ground, it was a pretty time-consuming process because the elevators could only hold so many people at a single time. In addition, the limited number of bulbs that could be used safely due to methane levels underground necessitated careful planning for lighting. And that was something I really enjoyed about the mine sequences, is that they did what they could to like light up where they needed to, and they also used the killer destroying the lights as a way to kind of isolate and further scare the kids. And I thought that was great for trying to maintain the uh, atmosphere of that scene at the very end. Now, during production of the film, the actors actually played their parts relatively ambiguously. The crew kept the killer's identity a secret from them until the very end of production when the very last scene was shot. And I'll talk about why that kind of felt a little bit weird, but I get why they did it like that. Production on the movie lasted in Nova Scotia from September 1980 until November 1980, when the filming was finally finished. And remember, they had this thing out by Valentine's Day 1981. So they got it done really quick. And the budget for it was only $2.3 million, which is pretty spendy for the early 1980s. But still, I think you get to see most of it on the screen when watching this movie, and it's one of the things I really liked. Another little interesting tidbit is the Ballad of Harry Warden. Now, this song plays in the end credits of the movie, and it's a really good song, actually. It's really kind of folky. I really enjoyed it. But Scottish-Canadian tenor John McDermott provided the vocals for this song, but he was not credited for his work in the film itself. Later on, only in one interview he ever gave about this, he explained that he was a friend of the family of the film's composer, a guy by the name of Paul Zaza, and he was fresh out of college when he was given the opportunity to record the vocals for the film. I, I don't quite know why he's so upset by that. I mean, sure, you can look at the quality 
of my bloody Valentine and maybe think, oh, great, I'm just established tenor. I don't need to be a part of this, you know, legacy. But at the same time, it's like, dude, horror fans are pretty awesome people. So they're going to love you for doing it, man. They might actually show up at your concerts, but yeah, fine. Be all hoity-toity about it, I guess. So what do I think of this movie? I I like it. I do. I like it quite a bit. When I went into it, I was a little apprehensive, predominantly because it's an older movie. It's older than me, and I'm almost 41. So for me, going into an old horror movie like this, there's questions of, will the effects hold up? Kind of like when I'm watching Evil Dead. I love the movie. I adore the movie. But sometimes some of those effects don't quite hold up. And while in the case of the Evil Dead, it definitely like appeals to its charm, Sometimes it doesn't always happen, you know, like the last starfighter is one that as a child I loved, but as a kid, even though I can look at it now and still appreciate it for what it is, some of those effects just really just get to me. And I was a little bit concerned that this movie, which is considered to be a horror classic by quite a few people, is one that just wouldn't grab me. Uh, no, I was wrong. I was wrong. I was 100% wrong. I mean, it opens up with like, you know, uh, a hot blonde miner taking off her clothes for a nice sexy tryst in the bottom of the mine, you know, 2,700 feet under the ground. It's definitely not the mile high club. Uh, and then the guy comes over, the other miner that she's thinking is somebody, and he's like, no, I'm not going to take off my mask as he slams his pickaxe right into the, uh, into the ground, you know, and then he just grabs her and shoves her on it. You're like, all right, all right, cool. This is going to be a nice little gory movie here. Actually, this is the one that I watched. I saw the director's cut of this and there was a whole thing with the MPAA in regards to how much violence there was. I'll talk more about that. I think in a little bit. But this was the uh, director's cut, so it has all the violence put back in. And yeah, the movie is way better with how gory this thing can get because damn. So after that, uh, we meet our cast of characters. They're all miners having fun, leaving the mine, you know, playing pranks on each other and stuff. They all go get a shower and they take off to go to the, the local dance hall where they're going to help, you know, their girlfriends get ready for a Valentine's Day dance. In fact, it's the first Valentine's Day dance in 20 years because they've been banned, not like Footloose, Banned, but they've been banned because, you know, 20 years prior, there was an accident at the mine in which two supervisors left five miners in the mines so they could go to a dance. Those miners ended up getting stuck because they weren't checking the methane levels and only survivor there, a guy by the name of Harry Warden, had to resort to cannibalism to survive and, of course, went insane from the ordeal. Then the next year on Valentine's Day, he murdered the two supervisors who left their posts, cut out their hearts, and placed them in Valentine's Day candy boxes with a note warning the town to never hold a Valentine's Day dance again or he will kill once more. He was then arrested and placed in a mental asylum and the accident was pretty much forgotten. But it still took 20 years for the mayor to kind of maybe get over that. And think enough time has passed. Let's spruce up the town. Let's play on the morale a little bit. And so he's excited to do it. And of course, all the kids, I call them kids. These are definitely people over the age of 21. Gretchen, Dave, Hollis, Patty, Sylvia, Howard, Mike, John, Tommy, and Harriet, Sarah, and Axel, and the mayor's son, TJ, are all there. And of course, Sarah, Axel, and TJ are all involved in a tense love triangle because TJ decided to leave. Valentine Bluff. He he bailed out. He went to L.A. He tried to make it in L.A. and he failed. And he came back home with his tail between his legs, embarrassed. But he's determined to get Sarah back, even though Sarah's now with his good friend Axel. It's a good plot device, to be honest with you. I thought it was kind of funny because there's really like no reason to like TJ. You know, he legitimately just like left the town. He didn't even like tell anyone where he went. He didn't even have the balls to break up with Sarah before he left town. He just went out there to make something of himself, screwed it up, and then came back and basically just like expected everything to go back to normal. As the protagonist of the movie, he's kind of a dick and you're not really rooting for him most of the time. You know, it's a good thing I, I liked Sarah because um, Lori Halliard's very attractive. So I was enjoying that stuff. 
But uh, I also didn't really care much for Axel as a character. I kind of felt like, you know, he has every right to be upset, but you know, the way the movie's going is he's ultimately going to end up losing the girl. If you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. Now, while there are people in the town, like the bartender, who are very much against the Valentine's Day dance, he is warning everybody not to do it because of what happened to Harry Warden, you've got the mayor and the city planner, Mabel, who are trying to get this thing off the ground. They want it to, to be a good dance. They know people are excited. They just want to celebrate Valentine's Day and Valentine's Bluff. It, it just makes sense from a small town perspective. But... It's here when the mayor and the town's police chief receive an anonymous box of Valentine's chocolates, but inside contains a human heart. And of course, a warning that the murders will happen if the dance proceeds. Now, again, we know that this is the blonde woman who died at the beginning of the movie. And quite frankly, no one ever mentions her again. And even at the end of the movie, when they're down in the mine and they have all the chasing around and everything, they don't ever come across her body which I thought was like a little bit weird because we just don't know what happened to her. Like no one ever asks, Hey, what happened to the smoking hot blonde? She was down here. Do we know what, do we know what happened to her? Did she hear anybody? No. Okay. Well, whatever. That's, I mean, that's like my only real complaint about that. It's not to say that it really matters, but it's just one of those story beats that I noticed could have been a little bit um, better explained. But what I like was the first kill. The first kill of this movie really like it was Mabel. Unfortunately, she's murdered when she's in the laundromat. Her heart is obviously removed. Uh, they go and they find her body in the dryer. And it's like, that's pretty brutal. That was pretty brutal. I thought that was pretty great. But then the chief decides that he wants to cover up her death to not freak out the town. So he tells everyone that she died from a heart attack and basically just like had her body shipped off without like really anyone talking about it because they just they don't want anyone to know that they think harry warden is uh is out and of course this is only exacerbated when they contact the mental institution where harry warden is but they find out that there's no record of him being in this mental institution so the mayor and the chief decide that they are going to just cancel the dance in order to give harry what he wants all right you took one life clearly possibly two lives um we're good okay we want to find you but we don't want to put anyone else in any danger dance is canceled so what do these teenagers these young young adults decide to do they decide to throw a party at the mine because it's the, it's like the weekend and like no one's there so there's the the rec room they can bring everybody over there and have a good time at the mine and of course you know, here is where like all the killing is going to happen. Even the bartender who is warning them about Harry Warden decides to go to the mine and he props up uh, a, a miner's costume as a way to like freak them out. And then, of course, he just gets killed. You know, it just it just randomly happens and stuff. So as the movie comes into its conclusion, obviously, the kids are throwing their own party. They're defying the law. They are making sure that. They are keeping to themselves as to not alert Harry Warden, but they also don't know about the murders. They don't know about any of this stuff because the killer has very much been really good at covering his tracks. That is, of course, until the guy Dave, it's always Dave, right, walks into the kitchen where they're boiling hot dogs. He gets his head shoved into the pot uh, and then gets his heart cut out. And that gets put into the boiling pot of hot dogs as well to later scare everybody and then from there, you have uh, Sylvia and her boyfriend. They head off to go have sex. And, you know, uh, she ends up getting killed by getting impaled on a shower head. And then he turns on the shower and the water comes out of her mouth. <laughs> I mean, the effects are definitely kind of dated. But I like the way that they shot that, that, that bit because we don't actually really see her. Uh, what we see is we just see like, her mouth open, a silhouette of her on the side, obviously a dummy. And then from there, the water coming out. So it just implies it without really showing it. And I thought that was really good because it's just, it was kind of like less is more just kind of leading into the whole, like, oh my God, that's so brutal. But then as people start to discover the bodies and they realize that the killer is nearby, they decide to clear out the party, contact the authorities. But it's during this time 
that a few of them decide to descend into the base of the mine in order to just kind of check it out, right? A little bit of like, hey, show me where you work, show me where you do this stuff, and maybe, just maybe, some people are going to get a little bit of nookie. And this is where we get into the final stretch that literally kills off like half the cast in like 10, 15 minutes. And the only person that I really felt bad about dying was Hollis. You know, because Hollis, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a rotund American. Hollis is a big portly guy. He's kind of like the Han Solo of the group, if you want my honest opinion. He is headstrong. He is confident. He will lead everybody down there. He knows what to do, what not to do. He brings the blankets for the women. He wants to make sure that they're okay. And even when they can't find the other people that are there, because, you know, they're already dead. Then he goes off and he's, he's trying to find them anyway. He go, he's, he's trying to be the good guy. And then he ends up getting shot in the head a couple times with a nail gun. And then he stumbles out to his girlfriend, Patty, who then basically watches him die right in front of her. And that just kind of sends her over the edge and she's freaking out. So they're trying to get the hell out of there. They're running around the mine. Axel falls into the water and they're like, are you going to go get him? And TJ's like, no, <laughs> I thought that was, I thought that was great. Cause he's kind of like, no, I mean, he's, he's, yeah, it's gone. You know what I mean? He's, he's dead. Like we're, we're fine. We're good. You know, we're, we're okay with that. We're, we're, you know, you're good. You're good. You're good. All right. You're, you're good. Sarah. That's the one I want to be with. Okay, great. You know? And so then they try to climb up the top of this thing and Howard, one of the other guys, the goofball guy who we haven't seen in like a few minutes, uh, all of a sudden, like his body drops after being hung, the head detaches from the body. They freak out. They run back down. Patty gets impaled in the gut with the pickaxe. And now it's just the last two with the killer. And this is when the movie reveals that it was Axel. I honestly did not see that coming because I mean, I, he fell into the water and I thought, okay, something about that's a little bit weird. Like, all right, whatever. But then he quickly was able to make his way back in, you know, and get the, uh, get the suit back on. Okay. Whatever. What I thought was interesting was we get this flashback to where Axel is a kid and he watches his dad, who was one of the supervisors at the mine get killed by Harry Warden. And this just like traumatized him. It just absolutely like messed him up. TJ then smacks Axel over the rock, which then causes the cave to collapse. As they get out of there, they're trying to walk on up. All of a sudden, we start seeing all these rescuers are running down the mine shaft, trying to get to where they knew the kids were to protect them. And then they go back into this cave and Axel is trapped. And, you know, Sarah being his girlfriend or, well, I guess now his ex, you know, because she has empathy and here he pulls out a knife and we're thinking like he's going to stab her, but he ends up like amputating his own arm and running away deeper into the mine, yelling out that he's going to come back and murder everyone in town and Harry's going to return and everything else. And we had just found out that Harry Warden had been dead for five years. So no, Harry didn't exist. He wasn't coming back. And clearly Axel was suffering from a lot of blood loss and insanity. So there's a high likelihood that he died in the mind, but I like that they left it ambiguous at that moment in time. What I also enjoy was that the killer used a pickaxe and the murderer's name was Axel, which I don't believe was a coincidence. And I think it was done with maybe a little bit of tongue in cheek in mind, but uh, I caught that at the end. So that was pretty funny. And uh, then of course, you know, the movie ends with Axel laughing maniacally as the song, the ballad for Harry Warden plays over the film credits. I like that. They didn't really give us like this, you know, grand kiss with the two lead characters. I mean, it's clearly implied that they were going to be together. It's clearly implied all that stuff was going to happen. And, you know, these movies are going to be like that. But what I enjoyed is just that it kind of gave us this ending of the killer kind of gets away I mean, obviously establishing if there's going to be a sequel or not, or at least maybe suggesting that there might be, but I just enjoyed that. It was like, I'm going to come back and kill all of you. And then end credits. And you're like, all right, gives the audience something to talk about as they're walking away. Maybe the critics liked it. I'm not too sure. In fact, when it comes to critical reception, it actually received uh, kind of mixed reviews upon its release. However, in the 40 years since it came out, uh, My Bloody Valentine has gained a pretty decent cult following. Many horror fans have actually praised the film's atmosphere and suspense, 
while others have criticized the film's pacing and the lack of gore. Again, I think they're mostly talking about the regular cut of the movie, the theatrical cut, not the director's cut. I thought the gore in the director's cut was just fine. Now, on uh, Rotten Tomatoes, My Bloody Valentine currently holds a 56% approval rating based only on 25 reviews, with an average rating of 5.6 out of 10. On Metacritic, it gave it uh, about 46 out of 100 based on 11 reviews indicating mixed or average reviews. And I think, again, horror movies tend to kind of have that response in these departments, especially with the ending of the movie being what it is. You just watch this guy like slaughter his way through an entire group of town and a ton of other people. And then he just cuts off his own arm and he runs off into the, into the cave. And then that's it, you know, and you're kind of left to just deal with it a little bit. I, I, I personally really dug that, you know, we got the conclusion. Harry Warden is dead. We got all that conclusion. Uh, we know that Axel's the bad guy. He cut off his own arm. He's got no, you know, no medical experience, no access to medical devices. He is likely going to die from blood loss or, you know, whatever's going to happen down there. He's not going to survive, but we don't have to go through all that. It's all just implied, which I thought was really, really interesting. However, so in a March 30th, 2007 issue of Entertainment Weekly, My Bloody Valentine was actually ranked 17 in a list of guilty pleasure movies, along with films like Dawn of the Dead and Escape from New York, and actually called the most criminally underappreciated of the slasher genre. In fact, Tarantino has called this his all-time favorite slasher movie, and it is definitely up there for me as well. Another retrospective assessment by a scholar named Jim Harper wrote in his book, Legacy of Blood, A Comprehensive Guide to Slasher Movies. He says that this film distinguishes itself from other slashers by moving outside the typical teen-based scenario, instead focusing on a group of 20-something adults in a working-class community and relying on a notable atmosphere dread. It's And that, that works really well for it. It's like, you know, again, the lack of future, the kind of isolated environment, the, you know, everything is laid out for you. You're just going to kind of rinse, repeat what your parents have done. There's a lot there that even kids today can relate to, which is one of the reasons why I think this movie has had the endearing support and fan base that it has. But how did it do box office wise? Well, according to Wikipedia, which is where I'm pulling this from, My Buddy Valentine grossed just 5672000 at the U.S. box office, though the U.S. gross did exceed the film's $2.3 million budget. It was ultimately considered a box office disappointment by Paramount Pictures, returning a dursery sum of only $3.3 million. This profit amounted to less than one-third of Paramount's Friday the 13th, which was released a year before. Yeah, Paramount wanted to kind of compete with its own slasher, so they released another slasher, hoping that it would, you know, strike fear into the hearts of the young, you know, movie going public back in 1981. And uh, it didn't, but look, Jason, it's such a unique movie and the way that it was done was such a unique way of going about it. My bloody Valentine. I think it's, it's, I don't want to call it like a thinking man's horror. Cause it's not, but it's, it's almost like it's elevated above what, Friday the 13th is, in my opinion, at least like at least talking about like, you know, social constructs and things like that, like where it decided to take the movie. Like if like if Friday the 13th was a slasher film for teens, My Bloody Valentine is a slasher film for their parents, <laughs> if that makes any sense. But like I said, the movie went on to find a, a lot of love on home video. It became a massive cult fan favorite over the years. And actually, as of February 2021, a two disc 4K release of the film is currently available for only $22 on Amazon. Worth it if you are looking to pick this thing up. And it's also streaming in a few places as well. But right now, it's only streaming the R rated cut and not the unrated director's cut, which is the far superior version of the movie. So let's talk about this director's cut because nearly 30 years after its initial release, the public was actually unable to watch the uncut version of the movie. In 2002, Paramount claimed that the alleged missing footage didn't exist, 
when the movie was first released on DVD in North America. See, when My Bloody Valentine was released in theaters in North America, it was heavily edited. As I mentioned before, every death scene in the movie had to be edited in order for the MPAA to give it an R rating. According to the producer, in order to get the R rating, the movie was essentially cut to ribbons. Even after the movie was cut to meet MPAA specifications, it was given an X rating again and more cuts were required. Though interestingly, the scenes that were actually cut from the movie did end up getting featured in Fangoria magazine before the movie came out. So they were kind of seen by the public. But let me just quickly reiterate my absolute distaste and hatred for the MPAA. Uh, again, it doesn't matter what year, it doesn't matter what decade, it doesn't even really matter what movie, F those guys until the end of time. But, but going back to the uncut version of the film. So in the late 2000s, Lionsgate did do the remake, My Bloody Valentine 3D, which again, is a fun movie. And in the process of doing this, they had also licensed the home video rights for the original film. And in 2008, they actually came across a copy of the movie that contained the deleted scenes that had never before appeared in the film's standard theatrical cut. This footage was included on an unrated Region 1 Special Edition DVD and Blu-ray that Lionsgate, with permission from Paramount, released in January 2009. The standard R-rated version of the movie is available on DVD and Blu-ray, along with uncut versions that restore the deleted violent scenes. Regardless of which version is being watched, three scenes, the flashbacks of Axel's father's death and Harry Warden with the eating of the arm play in their unrated versions. According to Mohaka, he says, with this release, we actually have it back to 80% of the image and 95% of the impact. And he said this in an interview when the movie actually came out on home video. Now, the entire uncut version is still not available, though the 2009 DVD and Blu-ray release did bring back three minutes of excise footage. Now that I think about it, that's probably the one that I saw. But why did this happen? Well, there are two explanations that are frequently given for the film's lopsided editing. According to rumors, Paramount was anxious to get rid of the offensive material because of the negative press Friday the 13th received after its release the year before. And interestingly enough, according to George Milhaka, the second reason why the movie was edited so badly was because John Lennon was assassinated in December of 1980. And as a result of killing the former frontman of the Beatles, yeah, there was a pretty large backlash against violent movies after his passing, because unfortunately, we as a culture are super reactionary, and that hasn't changed. That's just never changed. Uh, in the wake of something terrible happening, for some reason, absolutely unrelated things have to change. I don't get why that happens. It's so stupid, but it is where we find ourselves. But all that aside, the legacy of My Bloody Valentine lives on. It's a movie that is a lot of fun to watch. It is a movie that does, I think, hold up to the test of time. It definitely got the short end of the stick when it came out in regards to the MPAA, as I've said, F them. But the story is unique enough to be a very different take on the slasher genre, as well as being relevant enough to maintain itself over the span of decades. People before it came out could watch it. People after it could watch it. I think that's one of the beautiful things about it. But that being said, I leave it to you. Your thoughts, your opinions, good, bad, other. I want to hear them. If you happen to be listening to this on YouTube, thank you very much. Please consider subscribing to the channel and leaving a like and a comment. If you're listening to this where you get your podcasts and you happen to be on Apple Podcasts, please leave a review. That really does help out getting this podcast charting. If you've noticed also on the show, I have been posting a couple of more contemporary movies in between posting these episodes. That is going to be a goal of mine going forward throughout the year. There's a lot of new movies that are just a lot of fun to talk about, stuff I watched, like I just watched Plane last night, and I want to talk about it because it's actually a really solid movie. I just did the Megan episode the other day, and I'm currently working on a script for Infinity Pool, so look for that here in the next coming weeks, never mind the fact that we have about a month until the Oscars, so look for some of those movies to be popping up intermittently throughout the course of the month. I don't want to give it a complete release date, but 
intermittently. However, there will still be uh, episodes releasing every Wednesday. And those, uh, if you check out the Twitter, the calendar is going to be there. So definitely next Wednesday, February 22nd, will be the final episode of the month. And that is going to be The Running Man with Arnold Schwarzenegger, one of my all-time favorite movies. And one that I didn't realize was really disliked by Stephen King. But now that I think about it, yeah, I get it. All right, guys, I'll talk to you later. Have yourself a great time. Thank you again, and peace out.